So we got a two-part lecture today. Uh, part one is sort of some theoretical overview of uh, the 3D printing process and the, uh, the mechanics for how you get a part to the printers to actually print. And then uh, Isaac Thompson is in town, and he, uh, uh, he's been the one uh, basically uh, uh, setting up and maintaining the, uh, the, uh, the printers in the fishbowl, the engineering and display room. And uh, so ho hopefully he's going to walk us through, both uh, all of us, uh, how, to, how, to get, uh, how to get our, uh, our G-code uh, printed there and what, uh, what, how those are going to work. Hopefully we can use those. I don't know. There, there are lots of other alternatives. I was considering like uh, doing a crash run and just printing a bunch of printers for you to use. <laughs> some, some, so at some point, uh, the homeworks are going to have to move beyond simulation to actual physical objects. And to do that, you need access to printers somewhere. Uh, so the, the, the overall workflow, we, we talked about CAD last time. I mean, we talked about OpenSCAD, and there's, there's actually an enormous amount more to talk about. It, actually, I'm going to try and use that for most of the, the path planning examples, and I have to do composition geometry. So that's, that's not a, a, uh, a one-time a one uh, one time skill. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, I'm going I'm to design my part generally in, in, uh, in some kind of CAD program. I'm going to export the thing to an STL file. Uh, to get the STL file to actually print, you need to you need to plan the paths, right? So that's called slicing, mostly because uh, the conventional way for printers to print parts is to print them sort of one layer at a time. So you're you're essentially the you know the key operation in the slicer is slicing. So it's going to basically it's it's sort of like intersecting the part with this uh, you know a really flat little uh, 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 one plane, and then it's going to figure out you know how to how to how to uh, you know uh, put the put the machine moves uh, in to do that. Uh, standard place you store this is you store you store the print moves and the you know all, all of the everything the head should be doing in a G code file, and then somehow you get the G code file to a printer. And that uh, the, the last step depends on uh, depends on what printer you're using. Sometimes the slicing and the printing are kind of uh, combined. L less than less than I would think. So yeah. So apparently I have I have no network, but that's that's okay. Ah, uh, CAD. There's way too many options for CAD. Hey, how many people here use like SolidWorks? Okay, we got one, two-ish, three-ish. Huh. Uh, Autodesk Inventor? I know at Lathrop, they were, uh, Lathrop High School was really big on Autodesk for a while, so. Nobody, uh, Autodesk Inventor? Nobody, nobody made it here. Have you used on so OnShape is actually some kind of refugees from SolidWorks that went and founded a company that basically it's, it's supposed to be like Google Docs but for CAD. So the the, the huge advantage is uh, uh, most designs you know there's more than one pe person working on them and figuring out how to uh, transmit designs around. I mean f with OpenSCAD, the the way you get designs from person to person is with Git, right? Because it's all just text-based source code. So you check things in and then you you know merge you know you, you figure out how to do it up things in modules and you merge uh, you merge stuff together. Uh, free, free CAD is kind of a, uh, so, so SolidWorks, Autodesk, and Onshape, they're all sort of, uh, they're, they're GUI primarily. And, and maybe they have like some crude tacked on parametric uh, scripting thing, but uh, it's, it's, it's kind of an afterthought. Uh, t t Tinkercad is a really simple, just like, uh, you know, you, you drag in a cube, you drag in a cylinder, and then, and then you, can, you can set dimensions. Uh, t uh, t Tinkercad is also, uh, it's 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 web uh, as well. It, it, FreeCAD, you know, I, I used FreeCAD for a long time, and uh, it's great until it seg faults in the middle of doing something. And because uh, the, the, the really frustrating part about it is, like, you say, like, okay, program crashes now and then. That's cool. I can compensate by just saving a lot, right? The problem is sometimes it will silently break. It'll, something will go corrupted in memory, and when you save, you save the corruption to your file. So then when you go and reload that file, then the file is toast. Like, it, it, you know, the program will crash as soon as it loads your file. So you're like, ah, uh, don't, don't know what to do about that. Uh, the, the, the usual thing in any one of these GUI, like a GUI CAD program, typically you're building like a, essentially a tree, right, to represent the, all the operations you're doing on the part. That the, you know, the leaves of the tree would be things like, here, here's where I have a cube, or here's where I have a cylindrical hole through, through something or other. And, and then, I mean, most of the operations you want to do end up essentially just being transformations on that tree. So, right, I, I made a part here, I want to replicate a bunch of copies of the part. Uh, and I, I personally, I, I'm, you know, ha having, having used each of these a little bit, I, I haven't touched SolidWorks very much, but I, I've definitely built fairly big stuff in Autodesk and a lot of stuff in FreeCAD. Uh, 
but, uh, but but frankly, the, the maintainability of this ability to sort of directly, explicitly see the you know the structure of the part as a as as text. I mean, but programming is really powerful. So this is this is uh, so it, personally, OpenSCAD is, is kind of my favorite. The one downside of OpenSCAD is like if I have some big part that I haven't worked on for a long time, I don't remember what the names of all the objects are. So if I'm like this area needs to be smaller. I need to find where in the source code that area is. I actually, this implies OpenSCAD just mean, needs like a click on the part and it'll take you to the primitive in the source code that, uh, that instantiated the part. Nothing, nothing exists like that in OpenSCAD right now. Uh, d d depending on what you're drawing, uh, and, and actually I, I should say the sort of CAD, not CAD difference seems to be Step or IGES. And st Step and IGES basically, uh, uh, they, they let you represent actually curved surfaces. Those are built into the file formats. Uh, and, and, and it's not built into most, uh, like um, most modeling programs, so this is Maya, and I, I, there's probably a million more, Th 3DS Max, I guess. Uh, what, what are the 3D modeling programs? Uh, so so, so but Blender is the, the big free one. I, I actually really like, I mean, Blender is incredibly powerful. It's just really, the user interface is really bad. It's bad by the standards of open source software, which is a really low bar. Uh, it, it, apparently, uh, the Blender UI was modeled after some, the, 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 there was a very little used proprietary uh, powerful modeling package that somebody wanted to make an open source copy of. So essentially like the, the interface is like a clone of some ancient poorly designed thing that, uh, yeah, it's still, uh, it's, it's bad. Uh, SketchUp, uh, on the other hand, so SketchUp, uh, it, uh, Google bought them out and uh, has sort of re-spun them out, I believe. Uh, but it's it's basically a you know it's a, it's a drawing program that's really easy to use. Actually, you certainly see a lot of SketchUp stuff on uh, you know uh, sort of file exchange sites. Uh, but but uh, the, the the big difference I claim with most of these things is that uh, all, all of these programs are sort of a you know 3D modeling program is about making the shape look right, whereas a CAD program is making like the shape have the right dimensions. So like you know whether you know, I, I can, you know, in, in SOLIDWORKS, for example, I can say, like, between this, this face and this face should be exactly 14 millimeters, and it'll, you know, shift stuff around until it's 14 millimeters, and that's kind of, that's, you know, dimensioning is one of the primary operations in a CAD program, whereas in a, a modeling program, I, maybe Tinkercad should be down here, I, I don't know. Uh, the, 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 there is a universal with these, which is that no matter what CAD program you use, you're going to spit out STL file. And uh, it's, uh, it's a stupid triangle list was apparently uh, the nervous system uh, people that they gave a really great talk here a couple of years back. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, it's, it's just triangles. And the, the, the huge advantage of that is that it's so simple, like, you know, you, you, you can write an STL parser really easy, you can write an STL, you know, uh, generator really easily. Actually, uh, nervous system has a JavaScript, like, it's, it's sort of amazed me, like, they, uh, they, they, they this cool web user interface where you could design custom jewelry and then say, send this thing off. And uh, when, when you say sent it off, your web browser was actually doing the geometry calculations to figure out the, the set of triangles, and then it was sending the set of triangles off from the client, right? It didn't do any of the geometry on the server, which I was, I, I thought that was kind of, kind of amazing that that was possible, uh, and, and th th they did it because, like, th they don't really want to have all this bandwidth and compute, like, hitting that server and, you know, just uh, doing it straight on the client was, was totally doable. And, and a STL file is stupid enough, you can do that stuff in, in JavaScript, right? Because, I mean, I can manipulate the 3D, you know, corner, the three corners of a triangle are not that, it's not, not you know, it's just n number manipulation is pretty simple. Now, the downside is because triangles can represent things that can't be printed, right? So, for example, if I've got a, an STL file that has one triangle, that's not even a solid, right? Like, what do you even want to print, right? Do you want to print, like, a thin plate or something? I mean, it, do, it doesn't even... And it's, if I get two triangles that are just intersecting in some way, like, what were you after there? Like, uh, I mean, it, it's possible for an STL file to represent something that can't even be printed. Uh, and in particular, if, it's, if it doesn't, if it, so, so ideally, STL, STL file is like the whole outside of the shape, and it's a, it's a manifold object, right, in, in the sense that uh, that, that means all the vertices connect to, you know, uh, the, the vertices of the triangles all meet, and they form this continuous watertight surface. Uh, and that's, that's not always the case. It, it's actually, yeah. So anytime there's a malfunction upstream, it kind of shows up in the STL file being a little weird. And then everything downstream can kind of be derailed by that, or or it'll work fine. Just, uh, hard hard to predict. 
So people exchange STL files all over the place. So Thing Thingiverse is kind of the, this was one of the first, uh, the, the first uh, sort of file exchange sites. Uh, GrabCAD is a little bit more caddy, that there's, it tends to be a whole lot more, you know, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, dimensioned parts, the actual, you know, SOLIDWORKS files, source code. Whereas that Thingiverse is a lot of like OpenSCAD or like SketchUp or some kind of, you know, s s simple, actually a whole, whole lot more, you know, simple decorative stuff on Thingiverse, a whole lot more like functional stuff on GrabCAD. Uh, right. So, uh, e e most people put both, right? If, if I write it in OpenSCAD, I give you the OpenSCAD source code, so you c if you want to go and change the parameters, you can. But if you just want to print the thing, then I give you an STL file, and then, then you, have, you have both, so that's a, that's a good idea. It's actually, so the STL file is so dumb, it's kind of hard to like go and modify it. Like I, I can load up the STL file, but I don't, I don't have like this is a cylinder. Instead, I just have triangle, 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 triangle. Doesn't, I, don't, I don't really have a whole lot there. Uh, let's see, so, uh, n so once, once you got an STL file, actually, you can just send an STL file like to Shapeways or 3D Hubs. Actually, 3D Hubs, I was looking, has, uh, I, I've done Shapeways a couple of times in a couple of different materials, so uh, let's see, so I can just say, g give me a quote, and uh, I mean, th th they'll do CNC machining, they'll injection mold it, which is great if you have a lot of parts to, uh, uh, to do. So if I say 3D printed, they've printed apparently 1.7 million parts, so, so uh, oh, th they'll take uh, STL, OBJ, uh, OBJ is pretty similar to STL, just triangles primarily. Step and I just are the actual CAD uh, uh, CAD stuff. This, you know, the dimensions are not actually uh, uh, stored in the STL file anywhere. That's how dumb the format is. So it, uh, yeah. So we got printability, uh, and and then uh, depending on how much money you have. So I could say like, yeah, let's do this in stainless. And uh, so this is uh, this is like a laser is sintering stainless steel into a solid stainless steel part. And any color you want, as long as it's gray, basically. Uh, so, so, so it's 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 basically going to be you know la laser laser centering uh, centering that stuff. And I presume the prices get kind of get kind of big for that. Uh, it, uh, oftentimes, uh, uh, most of these are it's some combination of like the the outside dimensions of the part and the volume of the part. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the the worst example I guess would be uh, you need a block of steel. The most expensive imaginable way to get a block of steel is to like take you know these thin layers of metal powder and then laser them together one tiny piece of it. Like just pouring an ingot is what you should do if you just need a big block of steel. Whereas if what you need is like a metal foam mesh antenna that might have a total weight of four grams or something because it's just made of these tiny little filaments of stuff, 3D printing is like actually probably the cheapest way to make it because you'd have to start with a giant block of metal and then carve away all the excess stuff. So. It, uh, uh, w what you're making totally depends on what, uh, uh, what the right way to do that is. Uh, see, you do have to pick dimensions on that stuff. So uh, if, if you're going to print it yourself, it, I mean, one of the nice parts about Shapeways or you know, uh, 3D hubs is like, that's it. Like, you send off your STL file, and then you get a part in the mail. And, and then I guess then you grab your calipers and make sure your, all your dimensions were OK and make sure they didn't, you know, their fabrication didn't cause any problems. It, it, it's just a longer latency to do stuff by mail. But, but actually, c compared to like buying or building your own laser-based uh, you know, stainless steel capable 3D printer, it's probably the right way to do it, actually. Uh, it's, 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 it's also take more power than the average home <laughs> it's electrical probably. service provides. I have never done laser sintering, so yeah, I, I, I imagine with the, the, the consumables start to get really weird for that stuff, right? Like, uh, not only do I need like, you know, the kilowatts of power, but you know you have to tune and align the laser head, and then it's got to you know the, the your build chamber has to be filled with argon, like not the argon CO two that I do for welding, but like just argon, and uh, I don't know. I uh, think think things it's just weird weird consumables that you wouldn't uh, just you don't have laying around necessarily. Uh, so if you're doing this yourself, and in particular if, if you're doing this with uh, uh, the the sort of normal 3D printer, it's. Uh, uh, it's it's basically just uh, just gonna uh, need slicing. So I, I guess so. Uh, l let me show you some examples of this. So uh, somewhere here, I get uh, so here's this nice little bracket. This is part of the uh, uh, the Rostock uh, printer, and it's y you can see how this was modeled in OpenSCAD out of cylinders and you know plates and you know fa fairly. It's the, the the source code is not really that uh, that easy to interpret because it's just like you know. Cubes rotated, rotated, translated, rotated, translated, etc. So, so you know, okay, we, we got this this wacky part. 
Uh, the, 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 the basic place this sits on a delta printer is that the, uh, the guide rods go into the linear, uh, uh, linear bushings that are strapped onto the big cylinder areas. And then uh, the, the, the push rods that connect to the actual print head basically come right out of the uh, uh, right out of the middle there. It's got a little spot for a nut to hide inside there and to kind of permanently, like there, there's a, a, a place to trap the nut inside. Uh, th this is where I think you're supposed to like zip tie down the belt that, you know, pu pulls, uh, pulls this carriage up and down. So it's a, you know, it's a simple, simple little part. That there's, there's not really a whole lot to it, but, uh, but th there it is. So uh, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to save this thing as, uh, or I'm going to export this thing as STL. And uh, open SCAD, it'll say nothing to export unless you've pressed F6. So you've got to press F6. And then it's, so, so CGAL, instead of just drawing the part on the screen, this is going to actually compute the triangles for the part. So uh, you've you got to press F6, just a, kind of a silly UI thing. So I'm basically just going to save that thing as uh, a STL file. And uh, let's see, so, so now uh, uh, slicer program. So there's a bunch of slicers out there. So this is called slicer with a three instead of an E. I don't know why. I, I, th I think their idea was that that makes it uh, uh, easier to locate, uh, e easier to Google for. So let's see, so I was in the uh, hardware, Rostock, or this was the Delta printer, the Rostock maybe. So I, I, got, I got my STL file. I can load up the STL file. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Slicer doesn't normally crash. Uh, I, I, I think actually this is, uh, there's some bug when I suspend. OpenGL programs often seem uh, like they're, they're lost. So, uh, okay, so I, I basically put, pull my STL file into my slicer. So I've got, uh, okay, that's, uh, that's cool. That looks, like, uh, that looks like the STL file. Uh, if, if you click on it, this tells you the volume of the part. So this uh, volume is, uh, it's measured in cubic whatever units you use to set up the slicing. So in this case, it's millimeters. Uh, conversion from cubic millimeters to cubic centimeters, because CC is how we you know, measure stuff, most stuff. What uh, pop quiz? It's bigger than it, bigger than it sounds. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you lose a factor of 10 in each axis. So, uh, you know, because it's a 3D part, you lose a factor of 10 three times. So this is actually only 14.9 cc's. How much is this part going to weigh if I print it normal plastic? Oh, about 20 grams? Yeah, yeah so it depends on the plastic. Actually, my, my, my general rule is that like ABS weighs about a gram per cubic centimeter. So, yeah, so this is literally like, uh, okay, 15 cc's is like, yeah, the, it could call it 20 grams just, uh, just to be safe. How much is that going to cost me? Five bucks. Uh, so, 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 so the real question is what, what is, what is the, uh, uh, so if I, if I go to Amazon and I look for, uh, my, my printer uses three millimeter filament, I want ABS, then uh, you buy it by the kilogram. So this is, uh, one kilogram is $21. Which, uh, so that's a thousand grams for $21 or uh, what, uh, 50 grams is a dollar. So this is, this is literally a 50 cent part, which is actually, you know, it's, it's a, this is, this is, you need three of these to basically have the key parts of a Delta printer. So, so the, uh, uh, the, you know, it's, uh, it's cheap, uh, so surprisingly cheap. So let's see, so, so we've got the STL file loaded in. Now the other thing you kind of have to decide is how, so, so the part itself is 50 grams, or is, 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 is 15 cc's. So how much plastic I'm going to use depends on how I do the print settings. So, so the, 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 there's a bunch of these print settings, and this is kind of the, the there's, there's quite a lot of black art to how you do the slicing, like what, uh, what, what you end up, uh, what, what, how, how you want to do this. So in particular, uh, if I'm slicing a part, I, I can, I have a bunch of different choices here. Like uh, I can set the, uh, the interior, oftentimes doesn't have to be as much plastic in there as the outside. So actually most objects, right? In other words, if, if I've got like this, uh, you know, th this podium, it turns out this podium is actually all hollow inside. It's got this big empty space. Why didn't they make the podium out of just a solid block of wood? Dimensions uh, are hard. <laughs> yeah. And you wouldn't have storage to put your put stuff inside the podium. 
and, and, and there's a surprising fact that like if, if I have a rigid exterior like a, a box, then uh, you know I, I, I'm exerting forces on the outside. Like most of the you know the forces are going to be on the floor, they're going to be on the top surface. I guess I'm probably not really even exerting forces on the sides in particular. But basically, if uh, if I can somehow transmit the forces from the outside to the other outside, the part does its job. And this is true for almost all objects, right? Like, I could be totally hollow. There's no way to know. Like, it, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't actually, I guess my lungs are hollow, right? Uh, uh, there's, there's empty space inside here. It's, it's weird. Uh, so so th this is true for most parts, is that actually most manufactured parts, like almost all the steel and stuff in the classroom is actually tubes, right? Because the outside is the important part. And that's... Uh, <laughs> That's really loud. So, so you, you can actually set the infill. So, so the terminology here, like we're, we're going to be calculating like where we want the tool pass for everything. So it's actually common to not do 100% solid plastic. In fact, normally, you know, you, you can you can you can literally do 0% solid plastic. So I say like the interior totally hollow. Now uh, that that may not be ideal for some things, but uh, okay. So I, I've said uh, interior is totally hollow. That that disables a bunch of the uh, the settings there. Uh, perimeters is the uh, t uh, is the this this varies slicer to slicer. But basically, like I uh, if if I have a cross section, how many times I do you know uh, how many passes I make. So I start with two perimeters. Let me bump that up to three perimeters because if it's going to be totally hollow, then that's uh, uh, that's that's important. Uh, what, what they're calling hor at the horizontal and vertical are different different slicers, which is weird. So uh, layers on top and layers on bottom. So like you know when I'm finished, come so if you imagine printing like a cube, uh, perimeters is going to be like in the you know the cross section in the middle of the cube, like how many passes you make, and then I have the top and bottom. Uh, that I basically, you know, get, get, get to figure out how, how many how many passes to make there. So if if I go ahead and slice this thing, so I'm going to uh, uh, so I can I can just view this on the screen. So this is going to uh, it wants to save this if I can show it to you. No. So it it, it wants to save it as G code. So let me just go ahead and do that. And uh, oh my gosh, slicer really. Slicer. I think this is some Z stacking order problem, actually. Uh, huh? Slicer apparently has vanished. That's uh, that's weird. This is this is not slicer. Yeah, this is. Uh, I I have not had uh, problem. Yeah, it's it's still running. That's that's weird. I don't know if uh, projector is messing me up here. This uh, I, I use slicer like several times a day. So uh, I'm slicing. I did not save my changes to the infill setting. So, so th th there's 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 a million and one slicer settings. Usually you just figure out what works and then hang on to it. So I'm going to hopefully slice to G code and that uh, that worked fine. So so basically uh, this is a small part. It actually calculates the uh, uh, the tool paths pretty quick. I can. Uh, uh, you can visualize them in here, and and uh, it's actually kind of interesting to see exactly how it chooses to do things. I don't know if this how visible this is going to be. So if, if if I zoom way in, you can see that uh, I mean the part is composed of little layers, right? And there's it's basically done one one layer at a time. Uh, the, the, it's it's got a little slider where you can basically set the number of layers. So you, you can see I mean I'm at zero percent infill. So as it's building up the middle of this part, there's literally nothing. It's hollow inside, right? That I, I set zero percent. Uh, oh, and I, I guess uh, I, this is still at the two perimeters. So, so the outside is basically going to have a, a nice, thin, pretty layer on the outside, and then a fairly thick, uh, stronger layer on the inside. So, it, uh, so, it, 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 so basically, the, the, you know, the first thing a printer is going to do is going to put down a giant, fat, thick layer of plastic just to get something stuck onto the print bed, and then it's going to print a, uh, you know, a slightly thinner layer on top of that, and then it's, again, it's just print, print, you know, layer, layer, layer by layer. It's going to slowly build up the part. And uh, it, it, I, I often have to kind of squint at these things and make sure it hasn't like uh, done something really wacky uh, here. So, for example, uh, if somebody had uh, so 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 th this uh, this this happens fairly often that. Uh, I, uh, so, so this part was designed to print uh, to print pretty well, just in in the orientation it is. So if if I go ahead and uh, and, and do this, so now this is the same part but upside down. So I'm just going to I just pressed F6. I'm going to export this thing as a STL file for the carriage uh, upside down. 
So if I if I so if if you imagine slicing this upside down part, uh, everything looks like it's going to be totally okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, drop in the upside down carriage, re-slice, and. Uh, Anybody foresee any problems doing this print? Impotent, like, uh, so, so far, so good, right? We're printing these layers, and then uh, we start printing these, and that's, that's actually probably going to be OK, right? In other words, it's, uh, it's, it's basically you know, it's going to be going over and extruding you know, a little, little piece there. And uh, you know, everything's, everything's hunky-dory. What, what happens here? It's, it's, there's not enough, uh, so it's trying to extrude plastic out into empty space. It's just going to kind of dangle down in there. It's going to move sideways. It's going to go back in. And then it's going to stick, and that's OK. So these are just like going to be dangling like balls of you know, spaghetti uh, uh, hanging under there. And then it's going to build more stuff on top of those. Actually, eventually, it seems like you get this pile of spaghetti happening down here. And, uh, and it, it, each noodle sort of builds on the previous noodle before it, uh, and it gets a little bit further, typically. So, so, you usually, so, so usually, you can, you can make a 45. Uh, slope up relatively easily, so you actually so these might actually work. The tips are probably not going to work. Uh, and in particular, here we've got all this fancy geometry, like the little you know the little spot for the nut to get uh, to trapped in there. That's not going to exist, right? None of that is actually going to happen, <laughs> right? So so when you print this, this is going to be like a pretty nice looking base, and then just a ball of crap on the end that is just not. Uh, so so uh, there's actually a similar problem at zero percent infill. What, what happens, uh, so, so we've been printing, the, the middle was totally hollow, because like, yeah, who needs a middle, right? And no object really needs a middle. What happens when I hit this layer? Uh, all of this infill is basically, because it, it's going to finally try and close off the, you know, the top surface. And the problem is, it's, it's basically just extruding out an empty space. Now, you're a little better off, like here it's at least got support on both sides, so uh, although I don't, uh, yeah, this is this is not a great not great geometry for it. So, so so there's some hope that maybe like the spaghetti will stick and maybe it'll sag down in the middle some, but then it'll stick on the other side, because you know it, it comes out fairly viscous. So it can it's a, so uh, bridging is what it's called, and you know you could actually usually get like a you know less than an inch or you know a couple dozen millimeters is is doable for bridging, like. Uh, if, if you have a fan that's set up to specifically cool the thing at just the right rate, maybe like a 100 millimeter bridge is like you're really impressed with yourself. Uh, that, that, that if, you, if, you can, if you can span that far, uh, it, apparently like in uh, free fall, so in space, there, there's a, a, a you know, filament-based 3D printer on the International Space Station. And their bridging is really impressive. Because the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the filament doesn't dangle, right? It doesn't like sag at all. It's just like free, free out there in space. Now, the problem is that they still, so even in space, you can't do something like this, uh, mostly because like, you know, uh, getting out to this first corner is fine. But as soon as you turn the corner, basically like the, you know, the, 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 the tension of the filament is going to just, you know, pull the other filament the wrong way. So you end up getting these weird like curves or then it usually goes into 3D and wacky things happen. So uh, this, is, this is bad. We actually, uh, uh, we really couldn't print the part in this orientation. So, so you know, picking the orientation is important. Uh, it, it, lots of trade-offs you got to make. Like maybe I really wanted the, you know, the, the planes have to go this direction. So uh, uh, you do uh, cer certainly things to worry about for those things. So if you, if you absolutely positively got to print the part in this orientation, and there are things that sort of are just dangling out there, the, the problem is that, that, uh, that, that you know, filament needs to be supported, right? It needs to be held up either by the previous layer or by something you explicitly put in there. So you could, you could explicitly CAD in like a thin little plate or actually just a, a thin little plate running along the outside just to support the thing. Right? I, actually, I've seen uh, uh, you, could, you could do little dots or something that build up, and then at some point, you, you, you know, the dots switch over to bridges, and then the last thing is just this little, you know, it's just a little tiny support mechanism. Uh, so, so, so this stuff is called support material, and uh, the slicer can do this automatically. So uh, overhang threshold, so basically this is where you say what, uh, you know, how far out it, it'll print reliably without support material. So, so, so basically, like, it, it, it's not going to generate support material, material everywhere. So for example, those 45s maybe are OK. So let's see. So uh, overhang threshold I have set to 30, 30 degrees, which I, apparently I got that working on my printer. So I'm just going to re-export with support material, and we'll see what that looks like. 
So, uh, so, so basically, all, all that happens here, and this is uh, this is the downside. It, it 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 made like a giant thick block there. It's 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 it's, it's actually hollow. It's it, it's there's not as much there as it looks like. Uh, so let's see. So so you can see it's basically just this super like a thin one layer, like a little uh, skin of stuff there. So it's it's not it's not as uh, as bad as it looks. And, and then r right before right before it actually prints the stuff, it, it tries to do some fancy little detachable like matrix of stuff. This is this has been carefully engineered in there to, and it uh, presumably worked on their printer. I don't know. For for mine, it seems like it. it uh, so so uh, it's it's uh, it's certainly possible to have cases where the part prints fine with the support material, but then you have to remove the support material, and removing the support material without destroying the part sometimes is like not even possible. Uh, so, so there's a sort of, sort of trade-offs there. Uh, th there's, there's, you can see there's a million parameters on support material, like the, the contact Z distance. So, so you could say like just stay, stay way back from it. So, so here I'm, I'm a couple layers uh, away, and uh, so if I, if I re-slice, then this is, this is probably easier to subtract or e easy, easier to remove. So if I regenerate that support material now, there should actually be like a, yeah, a little bit of vertical space. So you can see that you know it's going to try and print, and then it's just going to like take a take a little breather there uh, before it actually uh, you know s starts in on the support material. Uh, th there are problems that automatic support material generation tends to like support things that like you wouldn't necessarily need to be supported. Like maybe uh, you know uh, in particular bridging works fine over really short distances. So this, there's a little there's a little passageway so you can uh, put a, a zip tie in to hold the uh, linear bearing on. And uh, apparently, Slicer thought that that needed to be supported. Actually, it, it, it thinks like the uh, the top of the nut trap needs to be supported, and this is the worst kind of support material to clean out. Like, it's just this tiny little thing glued into another tiny little thing. Usually, so you, you're gonna have to like drill out the holes. Yeah. That's fairly easy. But then, like, I don't know. I end up making some little tools, like chisels that are like uh, in a uh, like an angle shaped chisel to scrape that stuff out of there. Yeah, it uh, actually it's, it's possible. Like they're heating up like a nut, and then just like using heat to reform the part. Like suddenly, suddenly you're starting to get into like molding. <laughs> you're doing injection molding again. So uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. So so you, you can you can add support material, and, and again there are, there are a bunch of parameters there. Like you know I can set I can set the spacing. So you can see here it was basically like these boxes, but they're pretty hollow. You can make them really dense if you want. Actually, I usually crank this pattern spacing way up. Uh, dialing in the angle sometimes really helps too. Like if I have a, uh, a 45 degree angle, then uh, then that'll and, and uh, so as soon as I change the uh, the settings, it, it eliminates the preview until I re-export. So let me do that. So my, my sport material in inside here, you would think this would be at a 45. Yeah, okay. So there, so that's that's at a 45, and you can see, yeah, that's that's probably weird. I'm not sure what it was thinking with these. So, so several of these are kind of hard to figure out what it's what it's after. Uh, so c c questions about the support material. So, so support material infill. Th these are like the big ones, and, and usually like uh, I don't know twenty or thirty percent uh, infill is enough for a part that you know is uh, is not going to have too hard a life. If, if if I'm doing something actually in particular, if it's in the drivetrain of the robot, I usually just do hundred uh, percent. You know, it's uh, uh, more mass, and if, if I want to save mass on the part, so, so you can see this is 30% infill, and it's got this honey uh, sort of a grid shape. Uh, actually, again, there's a million options. Uh, th th there's some really fancy ones, like, uh, you know, uh, honeycomb looks awesome, frankly, so let's do the honeycomb. Now, uh, can, can you imagine a problem with having honeycomb shaped infill? It turns out this is like, uh, you know, bees know this is like the strongest possible shape. And you know it looks it looks pretty dang good. Uh, What's wrong with this? I'm thinking that it is it's probably the strength is dimensionally restricted, as in it's it, it, it is weird. Angles. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, so, so to me, the most annoying thing about honeycomb when the printer is printing honeycomb, uh, it, 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 so if it's not printing honeycomb, it's doing straight line like a uh, grid. A grid means basically, you know, very fast, very, uh, very quiet, easy on the printer. I've literally had printers shake parts off of themselves because they're like, oh, I need to do infill. 
And infill goes so you know it's, it's got to make this uh, this sort of uh, non straight line path. And I'm like, this is taking forever to do the non straight line path. Let me crank up the speed and acceleration. So now it goes and uh, pretty soon it's going <laughs> right. It's it's because it's it's just uh, and, and uh, you can do it. You can get you know. The parts of the beautiful infill, and they print pretty quick. But the the you know the printer is like walking across the desk. Uh, <laughs> the bolts on the printer are slowly unscrewing themselves just because that uh, you know repetitive vibration going back and forth does the infill. So that, yeah, yeah, it uh, that's important to have things survive. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I usually just do straight line infill. It doesn't it doesn't look that good. Uh, they, they, and, and you know, you can imagine, for example, you know, some of these super fancy ones of, uh, I don't even know what this is, so I'll find out. Uh, it curves, curves like, uh, you know, they get approximated by straight line segments in the G-code typically. Oh, you can see it had to really think about how it was going to do the infill there. So, yeah, wow, cool. Oh, they don't even connect. I guess so. Th this would maybe be pretty good for like supporting the top surface. Like it's kind of like the minimum amount of stuff to support the top. But uh, it looks like it has basically no horizontal strength. Like if you push on these uh, these sides. So yeah, I mean l l lots of trade offs, right? Like uh, you know, is this just a decorative part that's just supposed to support its own weight, or is it be getting rocks bounced off of it every day of its life until it? Does it flexing a little bit actually make it more suited for its purpose? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, m maybe, maybe, yeah, little waved spring shapes. Maybe that's the uh, the, the ideal. So, so lo lots of uh, lots of cool options there. Uh, right. So, so you know, this is this is all happening sort of below the STL file level, right? Uh, I guess the other thing that uh, and I. I, I didn't mention it because I just I haven't really thought about it. How fast do you want to print? Question. Uh, what's the three D on the look like? I uh, don't don't know. So, so, so uh, you can so even if you don't have a three D printer, you can download Slicer, and uh, you can you load up an STL file, and you can you know you can uh, so save one out of OpenSCAD, or uh, you know try uh, try this one. Yeah, I, th I don't know. Three D honeycomb, I presume, would be like making hexagonal cells that are connected to each other somehow. But I, I, I don't know if I've got a big enough part to be able to see what the heck is happening there. We can, we can find out. So uh, speed. So if I if I print faster, I mean, w what's faster is obviously better, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody wants it. So so again, clearly, like if I, if I double the speed, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea what it's doing there. It might be that's like too small to really see the fanciness. Actually, it, it, it looks like an interrupted hexagon. Yeah, it actually kind of looks like a good trade-off between like the ow, you know, of getting thrown back and forth and. Uh, and having a little bit more kind of diagonal strength to it. Yeah, so if, uh, if I print really fast, my prints are done faster. So, you know, and, and literally, and I can go from 30 millimeters a second printing, which is only like one inch per second, right? So I can, I can just put 60 or 6,000, you know, whatever uh, in there. So it, 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 the, it'll, you know, as it's printing, it will move, the head will move faster. And uh, what, what are your trade-offs? Yeah, it's actually very difficult for it to make, uh, in particular, you see like a, a corner. You know, you're, you're squirting plastic out in a straight line, that's relatively okay. It almost doesn't matter how fast you move in a straight line. But uh, when you hit the corner, you have to actually slow down the movement of the head so you can actually stop and go the other way. That's actually hard. Usually you get a little bit of overshoot, so there's some geometric like ringing that's gonna actually, the, you know, the frame of the printer is gonna flex a tad there. Uh, which, which is going to really matter. And the, the really hard part is if I'm booking, you know, I'm, I'm printing really fast, then I, I do have to slow down my, my physical movement, which means I have to slow down the rate I'm squirting plastic out. And the plastic, you know, it's kind of like uh, the toothpaste tube that you're squeezing, like is the moment you stop squeezing, stuff keeps coming out of there. So, uh, so you tend to get like extra blobbing. I mean, uh, uh, it's certainly possible to take a printer that's printing awful looking crap and just slow it down by a factor of two or four and have it print beautiful, perfect things. Uh, j just because uh, th there's a lot of stuff that gets a lot trickier when you're really um, uh, cranking along. Uh, d d usually the firmware is controlling the, the maximum acceleration, but the linear, and, and, and it's like capping the linear velocity. But the linear velocity, like, like usually, you know, the, they, I mean, most any, any printer will be able to do like, like three inches per second, or the four inches per second. That's not like, you know, that's not a ridiculous, it's not like breaking the speed of sound or something. Like this is not, 
not that big a deal. But uh, as far as like extruding stuff in a controlled manner and getting you know getting the stuff to actually stick, I, I've certainly had cases where if if you're really just whipping along. It, 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 there can be cases where basically the, the plastic itself has to kind of like melt onto the previous layer, and if you're, you know, if it's just like, you know, whipping down a, a very thin layer, then uh, doesn't doesn't have time to do that. So, so, uh, t uh, so when they talk about tuning a printer, like uh, getting the velocities right, uh, the, the other the other big thing, I guess, is getting the thickness of the layers right, and and this is this is again just a sort of a straight line like. Uh, if I have 0.3 millimeter layers, which is kind of a good middle of the road, kind of coarse, I mean, you can see this part is going to have like visible layers. It's going to be like a 3D printed look to it. Uh, you can make it print way faster if you go with bigger layer height, right? That's so, so like a 0.6 is going to be almost twice as fast. Uh, so if, if I do that, but now, now the downside is that uh, I'm going to have bigger, more obvious layers, right? Now that's really starting to look Minecrafty, right? That it's just made from big blobs of stuff. And, and conversely, if you want to have this, so I can do 0.1 millimeter layers, that's going to take three times longer than the, uh, you know, the, the 0.3 millimeter layers. Uh, and uh, the, the other problem with 0.1 is that uh, if there's any vertical deviation anywhere in your system, like there's a little bit of play in your z-axis, it might be fine. It's not a problem at 0.3 or especially 0.5, but if you're at 0.1, like you can see how beautiful, you know, these are like uh, almost invisibly thin layers. Right, so you get these like just uh, very, very beautiful print. Like you need, you need a loop or something to see the layer lines. You're like, this is beautiful. The problem is, uh, a, your your time just linearly goes up, which uh, is is bad. Uh, b, it gets harder and harder to like squirt the plastic out to get it to stick in the very thin layers than if you're you know, hosing a pretty reasonable. So, so uh, th th these uh, these things are kind of hard to tune in. So it's actually, usually. You know, when I when I have a new printer, a new uh, you know filament, etc., I uh, I do I have to dial all those things in. Uh, for the filament itself, like the the actual dimensions of the filament, how much you want to squirt out, and what temperature you're squirting it out at onto the temperature of the bed, that's basically it. And and these are pretty much figure them out, and, and that's it. I've definitely spent a lot more time messing around with velocities and layer heights and stuff. And temp temperature usually printed on the spool. So, c questions about the uh, the slicing? Are you swapping out knobs <coughs> for different thicknesses? Ah, uh, no. You usually use the so uh, same nozzle will do you know pretty big range of uh, layer heights. I mean, you, you can totally swap out nozzles. In particular, like if uh, if you want to do great huge layers and you have a tiny little nozzle, it's actually hard to squirt. Like you have to really crank your linear velocity down, or won't be able to get enough plastic out. So uh, yeah, so, so the, there there are there are a few trade offs there, but actually usually the same the same printer will do like a factor of you know four or five range you know point one to point five is probably doable. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna go down to the engineering and display room because hopefully Isaac is waiting for us and he will uh, show us how to use the printers down there, and uh, and and. Uh,